Okay. So picking up on fat analysis. So what's the definition of fat or lipid? Do you do you know the definition for lipid? Is there a definition for lipid? There might be not a definition for lipid. Yes, Jane. Is it a hydrocarbon bond? That's the chemical structure definition of, of one part of a lipid, which is triglyceride, right? Uh, what was I going to call you, Adam? <laughs> Sam. So, uh, so triglycerides are like fatty acid attached to glycerol. So that's triglyceride, which is one component of lipid. Um, but if we want to think of lipid as a um, component of food that might include triglycerides, cholesterol, uh, vitamins that are fatty, uh, fat soluble vitamins, it's a very diverse group of lipids, really. So if, there, if we want to think of a definition, there's not really a definition for uh, lipid. It would be mostly saying that lipids are uh, components of food that are soluble in organic solvents. So that's how they kind of define them in terms of their solubility in organic solvents. But there are also polar lipids, like phospholipids, di and monoglycerides, or di or monoacylglycerol. So glycerides, monoglycerides, diglycerides, the same thing as monoacylglycerol and mon diacylglycerol. They, they mean the same thing. So these are polar lipids and phospholipids, phospholipid, which is basically a glycerol with two fatty acids. And then the third place is a phosphate group. So phospholipid, because of that phosphate group becomes really polar lipid. So, so some lipids are soluble in more polar solvents than other lipids like triglycerides and uh, triglyceride is a very hydrophobic uh, lipid. So there is not really that one great definition because of the diversity of the different lipid components. So basically here, just an example of what simple lipids are like triglycerides, which is basically your, your glycerol with three fatty acids. But you have also di and mono acid glycerols. You have esters of fatty acids, just such as vitamin A, which is the retinol palmitate. And there are compounds that are heterogeneous lipids. Phospholipids is heterogeneous because it contains a phosphate group. Lipoprotein, it's a component that has both components of a protein and a, and a lipid or fatty acid. Glycolipids, such as cerebrosides, these are glucosides attached to lipids. So you have a carbohydrate group attached to lipids. So you have that diverse um, different components that, are, that all belong to the lipid component. Of food. So, why is it important to analyze fat content? Labeling. Yes. I was looking to see the other answers I received without looking. Yes, nutrition labeling. So, we need to determine the total fat to put that on the label. Yes, as part of the complete document analysis. Yes, for, well, diet, we want to put it on the label so we want to know how much fat we're consuming. But also, later on, we're going to talk about fat characterization. So we want to know how much cholesterol we have, how much uh, um, saturated fatty acids we have. So we really need to know how much trans fat we have. So these, this, all of these different components, we'll talk about them under fat characterization chapter. But we analyze content, total content of fat to do um, nutrition labeling. What else can you think of, Sam? Yes, 
So I really need to know how much fat I have in my cell, my food product, so that I can assess shelf life stability because you know, fats, especially if you have unsaturated fatty acids in your fat, then you end up getting um, oxidation. So oxidative rancidity. Also, if you have high fat content, even if it's not necessarily uh, all unsaturated fatty acid, but you have endogenous enzymes, like in uh, flour, for example, you have fat, you have lipoxygenase, you have lipase, so you have lipase that can break down your fat into free fatty acids. They, they taste awful, they have flavor issues. So that we call hydrolytic rancidity. So you have oxidative rancidity, you have hydrolytic rancidity, like oxygenase cause oxidative rancidity, you have auto oxidation as well. So it's a big deal in terms of shelf life stability, in terms of flavor and taste. So it is important. Great. So um, nutrition label, stability, what else is really important? Dan? Yes, standard of identity. Thank you. Yes, a lot of food products, especially dairy, um, they have standard of identity for milk, how much fat content for different cheeses, what would be... Um, low fat content if you want to claim a skim milk versus 2% milk. So you really need to know your fat content. So nutrition labeling, that means um, doing your approximate and getting the fat. Well, actually, fat content on nutrition label is determined by measuring total uh, fatty acids, fatty acid composition and measuring total fatty acids and then calculating using molecular weight of glycerol, calculating uh, based on total fat. So that's how you determine fat content for nutrition labeling. Uh, we talk about standard of identity, sometimes manufacturing specifications. So yes, if I want to produce a low fat product, any low fat product, whether it is low fat ice cream, low fat yogurt, and, and what have you, I want to know how much fat I wind up after by process. And we talked about stability. So with anything, everything we're going to learn from now on and uh, before also a little bit. Everything we want to analyze, you have a slew of methods to choose from. You have so many different methods that we can choose from to determine our component. In fact, for fat specifically, we have so many methods that are solvent extraction methods. That means we need organic solvent in that method. So we have the goldfish apparatus uh, that we use for continuous fat extraction and fat analysis method. It's a continuous solvent extraction method, basically. Uh, I used it when I was an undergrad and also when I started teaching early on, that was the only available instrument that I had to, to use for fat analysis. I'll talk about it in a minute. So I continuous is what you're going to do in the lab. Salsa is very common. It's official method of analysis. It's really good for high fat foods, meat products, nuts. It's good for cheeses as well, but Mojoiner or Mojonier in French, or my students like to nickname it as Mojo, so you can call it whatever you want, uh, is a discontinuous solvent extraction. So you use solvent, but in a discontinuous manner, and we will talk about that. Other solvent-based methods, uh, usually they're used mostly as a preparatory step where we want to isolate the fat component or fat soluble component and then do different analysis with them. So um, it is so, uh, supercritical fluid extraction, accelerated solvent extraction. So these two methods, we'll talk about them now. Don't worry about acronym right now, they are in your slide. And then finally, the GC method, uh, the FAME, which you did in the lab, but 
you would do it in a quantitative manner rather than semi-quantitative to determine total fatty acids, and then you convert them to total triglycerides, and you get the total fat that way to report on the nutrition label. So, so many methods that are solvent-based. Uh, even GC method is a solvent-based. Why? Because in any food product other than oils and fat, you need to extract the fat first before you do GC. So you have to extract with hexane, with a combination of ethyl ether and tet ether. So you extract the fat, and then you take that fat and do the same method you did uh, for uh, fatty acid composition and quantification. Non-solvent wet extraction method, we have Babcock, Babcock and Gerber. Both are um, used for dairy mostly, and we'll have, uh, we'll talk about them later. Instrument-based method, IR, near IR, mid IR instrument can be used as a quick quality assessment um, method. So online during processing, you, you get a sample and you quickly determine where you are in fat content. Definitely it needs calibration. Fosley method is um, based on measuring specific gravity and NMR instrument based method as well. So I'll briefly talk about these at the end. So the bulk of the method then are solvent extraction methods. And in the lab, you'll be doing two of those. You'll be doing shock slit, semi-continuous extraction method, and you'll be doing mojo or mojiner or mojoni, discontinuous solvent extraction method. Like with everything you do, there are sample preparation and solvent selection. So what's the type of food I'm needing to determine fat content? So this is important. Is it a high carbohydrate food? Is it high fat, high protein food? Is it mush, high in moisture, high in fat like meat? So what kind of food I have first? So I need to understand the matrix and the matrices and what kind of complexity I have so that I can choose my method. Is it high moisture food, low moisture food? Because some methods like Soxlet, for example, it's better, you have to pre-dry your sample if it is high in moisture. So for example, those of you in the lab that have cheeses, processed cheese, cheddar cheese, even Parmesan cheese. So any, any product that has more than 10% moisture, it is recommended to dry first then measure fat using soxlet on a dry basis. So understanding what we have in terms of different components in the food is very important in terms of selecting a method or selecting preparation of the sample. Um, it's also important to know, to know that when you want to measure fat content using a method that requires extraction of fat, you need to have a certain um, particle size. So it is, it is very important that you homogenize your sample and you break down this particle size to enhance surface area and to enhance the extraction efficiency. So it's, this is really important. Like I remember one time we had um, capstone group uh, that was working on a product that is chips, potato chips product. And they wanted to determine the fat content related to the shelf life stability of their potato chips. So I walked in and they were using a Mojiner method to do that. And they had to put the sample in a flask and they have to add different reagents. We'll talk about it later. And so part of these reagents are your organic solvents. And I walk in and I find one of the students is having the sample in there and trying to shake it because there's a shaking step that you will be doing in the lab. And I look in there and I saw one piece of a potato chips, one whole piece of potato chips. 
I was like, what are you doing? And they said, are you extracting the fat? I was like, no, you can't do that. The fat is not going to come out out of this whole potato chip. You really have to homogenize your sample and be fat. So the type of preparation is very important. And understanding the type of food and the different matrices is important so that you know uh, what um, method you want to use and how you want to prepare your sample. Nature of lipids is very important too. Is the sample mostly made up of triglycerides, the fat content? So they're mostly hydrophobic uh, lipid, or do you have a lot of phospholipids and uh, mono and diacylglycerol? So you need some polar solvent in there. So you want to know what is the nature of lipids so that you can determine your solvent or solvents that you need to use. And then your extraction method is it, like I said, what do you have? Do you have, um, do you need to use the Magina because it has a hydrolysis step or solubilization step or Soxlet is fine? Or do you need to dry the sample before Soxlet? Magina, you don't need to dry the sample. So you see what you have available in the lab, what's the simplest way to do it and what's the one that would give you the most accuracy. Now, to extract and analyze fat content in a food sample preparation may include pre-drying, acid hydrolysis, particle size reduction. So that's part of what I was talking about earlier. So what do you think? Answer already coming in as G. Yes, all of the above. If it, it depends. Pre-drying might not be important if we're doing more drying. So we don't need to pre-dry. If we're doing socks, it really depends on the moisture content. Is it really a flour sample? The moisture is 10 or less, or is it a cheese sample? The moisture content is 10 or above. So that also depends on what method you're using. Particle size, yes. In any case, you really want to reduce your particle size when you have, especially those solvent-based extraction methods. Acid hydrolysis, Sometimes, yes, when you have high protein, high carbohydrate uh, food matrix, your, your lipid is really interacting with the carbohydrates, it's interacting with the protein, and it makes the solvent, it becomes really hard for the solvents to kind of extract that fat. So we need to release it from a complex matrix. So acid hydrolysis helps. So it hydrolyzes, um, the starch, we usually put like HCl acid hydrolysis. So basically it breaks down the acid, breaks down, uh, sorry, breaks down the carbohydrate, also can hydrolyze uh, protein. So you end up with more efficient extraction. So here you can see you have dried egg. If you do acid hydrolysis, you get 42.39% fat. Without acid hydrolysis, you get 36.74%. So that is about, what, 6, 5.5% difference. That's a huge difference. And dried egg basically is really high in protein, and there's a lot of protein uh, lipid interaction. So if you hydrolyze the protein, you can release that lipid from interacting with the protein. Flour, 1.7 versus 1.2. You, you go, this is 0.5% difference. It makes a difference when you really have low fat content. It does impact your accuracy. 0.5 out of 1.7 is huge, is almost one third uh, of your fat content. Uh, noodles, same thing. Semolina, same thing. First Wednesday of the month. Oh yeah, they're gonna do it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so we see that. Now, if we look at cheese in particular, because some of you will have cheese, we don't necessarily use acid. We use alkaline to solubilize the protein because the cheese curd, the cheese is really a, a gel matrix, a, not gel, but um, what do you call it? And, um, ah, I lost my word for it. Um, coagulum. 
it's a coagulum, it's not a gel. So it's really your fat is really entangled in a coagulum uh, structure. So we put alkaline there, uh, ammonium hydroxide, I believe it is, it, to kind of solubilize your protein so that we can release the fat with the, with the um, solvent extract. Okay. Oh, so you might say, what would be the answer? It's safe to say G, but you, because I didn't give any specific in the question. If I give a specific high fat, uh, high carbohydrate, uh, low moisture food, then you can, you can select which ones of these would be correct. If I don't give specifics, yes, may include. I only say may include. Yeah, may include any of those. Okay, so G would be the correct answer here. Okay, selection of solvents. Again, we have a very diverse group of components that all uh, are under the category of lipids. So basically, we want um, a high solvent power for lipid and low solvent power for protein and carbohydrate. What does that mean, solvent power? means that the solvent that solubilizes the lipids and does not select for protein or carbohydrate. Um, low boiling point would be really nice. Then you would only need a little bit of heat to uh, evaporate the solvent after you extract uh, the fat so that you can measure the fat. That is for the diner is one big step. But in succulent, you need low molecular uh, point, boiling point, not molecular, low boiling point because you put your sample and then you use solvent that you want to evaporate and condense into your sample to solubilize the fat. I'll show you the diagram in a minute and you do it in the lab. So you need really low boiling point. You don't want it to, you don't want to wait until it reaches high temperatures to, to do its job. Uh, Non-flammable, okay. Non-toxic, very good. Non-hygroscopic, that means does not absorb water because if it's hygroscopic, the problem with that is once it enters the food and if there's a lot of water in moisture, then the moisture is going to be picked up by your solvent and that will interfere in um, solubilizing your fat. Inexpensive because you'll see in some um, uh, methods we have, you use a lot of solvent. And using a lot of solvent, I mean, that's would be eventually costly, costly. So you want to work with solvent that are inexpensive. And also you want universal solvent. That means it solubilizes the hydrophilic or the polar lipids and the non-polar lipids. Is there a solvent with all these characteristics, you think? You think? No, there's not unfortunately. Um, so what do we do in this case? Mo most of the time we combine, we use multiple solvents. Or if we know exactly what kind of uh, lipid components we have, we might select the solvent that better extract the components of interest. So common solvents we use in fat extraction, and we'll be using them in the lab, is ethyl ether and petroleum ether. So there are a little bit of differences between the two um, solvents. We say ethyl ether is generally better solvent for lipids. I would rather use the term lipids here rather than fat. Generally a better solvent for lipid. Why is that? Because it, it can solubilize the nonpolar as well as some of the polar. Uh, components. Petroleum ether is more selective to hydrophobic components of the lipid, so more selective to your triglycerides, for example. Ethyl ether is more expensive, the other one is cheaper. However, ethyl ether has greater danger of explosion and fire hazard, and I'll tell you two stories here with possible fire hazard that I was responsible for. 
And the after ether is hygroscopic. So that means it loves water, it picks up water. And it is good, it has a low boiling point. So you only need a little bit of heat and then you get evaporation out of it. So petroleum ether is cheaper, less hygroscopic, less flammable, a little bit higher boiling point. So each one of them has their advantages and disadvantages. What do we do? We often time mix. So you'll see that for the Magrinder method in the lab, you will be mixing both ethyl ether and petroleum ether. So you will be utilizing both to kind of counter the effect of the cost, but at the same time benefit from solubilizing bigger portion of the lipid, not just the hydrophobic lipid. And, and have a balance between hygroscopic and non-hygroscopic. <coughs> so we mix. This is goldfish apparatus, which is the first apparatus for fitted fat analysis that I was uh, familiar with or I was exposed to. And I'm going to, again, use the back, black whiteboard behind me to, to, to draw the different components. Because here in the picture, you can't see the different components that go into your sample compartment. So what you have here, just to show you on this um, picture, so these are hot plates. So these, the metal parts here are hot plate. So you control the temperature and you don't want it to be really more than like 35 to 40 degrees because that's enough to cause evaporation. And here, this metallic part up here also is a condenser. So you have water, so there's an entrance for water. So you have an inlet and an outlet for water. So you basically are running cold water in there. And here in the middle, you see this is your sample compartment, solvent sample compartment. And that's what I'm going to draw behind me so that you can see what's in there. If it's not clear, or hopefully those of you on Zoom can see. Um, so the, where you weigh your sample, you weigh it in something we call a thimble. So the thimble uh, is, can be um, disposable, made of fibrous material that is disposable, or it can be ceramic portion, partly ceramic, um, but it's porous. So it is a porous material. The one that you're going to use in the lab is the disposable white porous thimble. So you have your thimble and you put, you weigh in your sample, one to two grams of sample. So you have your sample now here. We put glass wool on top, so inside of that thimble. So basically you put glass wool so that when the solvent is in there and there's a potentially um, a lot of solvent that go can condense in there, you don't want any part, uh, uh, powder from your sample, any particulate from your sample to go out of that thimble compartment. Why you don't want it to go out? Because that thimble is placed in a glass tube-like structure that is open from the bottom. So, yeah, so here, it's not where the sample is, it's open at the bottom here. So you don't want the sample to go back in your tube because in your um, beaker or sort of a beaker, because that beaker, you have your solvent in. So your solvent is here. But before you put your solvent, whether in this case it's ethyl ether is what is used. Before you put your ethyl ether, you weigh that beaker like container. You pre-weigh it. So you weigh it and then you have your solvent in it and then you have your thimble inside of that glass compartment that is open here 
So what happens in this case is you put it on the hot plate. So the solvent is going to boil off and go up into the condenser. And then it's going to condense into your thimble where your sample is. So it's going to solubilize the fat and carries it into the original beaker that had the solvent. So that is a continuous process. Continuously, you have your solvent evaporating, going up into the condenser, condenses into your sample, solubilizing the fat, and through the pores of the thimble comes out and then the fat will end up in that original beaker. So what you do at the end after two to three hours of extraction, or even more hours of extraction, depending on the sample and the fat content, what then happens is you take out that beaker and then you evaporate the ethyl ether. <clears throat> so you evaporate the ethyl ether and you end up with an, your fat in that beaker and then when it's completely dry, you weigh it out and you get the weight of the fat. That's why it's important to weigh the beaker before you put your solvent in. So it's very simple, but dangerous. So I caused an explosion. I was working with this. Um, and teaching a lab many years ago, not here, somewhere else. And there, you see here, I don't know if you can see, but you basically, you screw this whole thing onto the um, condenser. It has to be screwed on really tight. Why is that is important? Because if it's not screwed on really tight, when the solvent goes up and condenses, it might leak and hit the hot plate. And then what happens? Explosion. <laughs> it's going to explode. And it did explode in my face at one point. Um, good thing the students were behind me and I was turned and I was talking and all of a sudden I see it dripping, it hit the hot plate and boom, in my face, I lost my eyebrows and my fringes, part of my hair, but then survived it. Anyway, so I was traumatized and then came here and then started to teach this class and they didn't have a goldfish apparatus. So they said, great, what do we have? We have a sock slip. Hmm. I, I also almost caused a, a problem there too. So, so it was my first time being exposed to um, the sock slip and I looked at it and was like, oh, that looks much safer than the goldfish apparatus. I looked at it and the, the way it was set up, there's nowhere for leaks. Like that's perfect. There's no way that this is gonna leak on me. So we set it up in the lab on the benches, not in under the hood. But let me explain it first before I tell you what happened. All right, so what is that? So the Foxlet is pretty neat glass-based apparatus. So you kind of build it yourself kind of deal, but you need to have the right parts. So you have a round bottom flask where you put your solvent. So you're gonna put ethyl ether. I'm, I'm thinking about 300 milliliter of ethyl ether. You put few glass beads in there just to prevent excessive bubbling. Um, and you have a hot plate again, each one of those is sitting on a hot plate. And on top of that is the compartment where you have your symbol. So this is the sample compartment. And it's the same thing, you use this white porous disposable material symbol to weigh in your sample and you put glass wool in there and you insert it into this compartment. And you have the condenser is on top of that. So you attach the condenser to this compart sample compartment and you have running water in there, cold water for condensing. 
this is a special unit where you have a siphon arm. So this is very cool. I like the, that's the best part. I like the siphoning of the solvent. Because what you, you have here is your solvent is going to boil off, evaporate. It's going to go all the way up into the condenser and condenses down into the symbol. This here is closed. It's not open. This part down here is closed. So there is no connection between this compartment and the solvent down here. So it's closed. So what happens is the solvent is going to drip, drip, drip into that compartment and there is a soaking step. So it will be soaked with the solvent. That's why it's called semi-continuous. Because here you don't have the solvents going up and down, going up and down. We call this sometimes you might get what a phenomena called channeling in the goldfish apparatus. What is channeling? Channeling meaning the solvent going evaporating, going up, condensing into the sample, then into the beaker without carrying any fat. There's no time. It just passes through. So it channels through. Here, there's no channeling. So it's more efficient. You get most of your fat out. So that's the advantage of Sockfit over Goldfish. So remember that. That's one of your questions for your lab report. So basically, what happens here is you get to a certain point. The solvent fills up to a certain point. When you reach a certain point here, it, the, the difference in pressure may, allows that solvent to siphon. It reaches to a certain level and it fills inside of that inner siphon arm. And then as it goes up, up here, reaches here, it sucks down all of the solvents back inside. So all of the solvent will come down and it at the same time, more solvent is evaporating. So that's why we call it semi-continuous because the cycle repeats. There is a soaking step, which gives this toxin an advantage over goldfish because you, are, you don't have a channeling effect. You soak the sample, fat gets solubilized, and then siphons, the fat siphons with the solvent into your um, round bottom flap. So at the end, you have two ways of getting your fat content. Either you take this flask, if it's pre-weighed, you can take this flask, put it on a rotary evaporator, like the one you saw during MS lab, and evaporate the solvent, dry it in a little bit in the oven, and then weigh it. And then you get the weight of the fat directly. But there's a lot of solvent. There's 300 milliliter of solvent. That takes a lot of time and a waste as well. Waste of time, a lot of time. So what you do instead is you take the weight of your symbol. So you weigh your symbol, you weigh your sample, you weigh everything with the glass wool, and you take the weight and then you put. After the, the solvent extraction is done, you take the symbol out, you leave it under the hood for a little bit, so that any residual solvent evaporates under the hood. And then you weigh, you put in a desiccator and you guys come and weigh it. So you take the difference in weight. So the difference in weight is the fat loss in this case, right? So the weight at the beginning and then the weight at the end is the, when you take the difference is the amount, is the amount of fat that was taken out of the sample into the flask. And that's how you get indirectly, you get the weight of your fat. Okay, now what did I almost do uh, 12, 13 years ago? I saw this and I thought, oh, this looks very safe. There is no way that they're gonna be illegal. So we put it on the benches and I'm gonna say one of my TAs turned on the hot plate to the max. Okay, so what happened? The solvent started boiling so hard and evaporating at a very, very high speed, faster than the condenser's ability to condense it down. So what happened, it was 
So it was up here, the solvent was up here and, and condensing, but there's a lot of it coming and it started coming from the other end. The solvent started dripping from the other end and getting onto the hot plate. Okay, I panicked at that moment. So I kind of asked the student all to go out and told them not to panic. They were calm. They didn't know what there was happening. I was the one panicking, but we controlled the situation and there was no explosion that time. And from there on, it was placed under the hood, safely tucked under the hood, not on the bench. So lesson learned. Okay, good. So both goldfish and toxic methods are gravimetric. So you, that means it's based on taking measurement of the weight. Um, if we're doing a cheese sample, which some of you will be doing, but all of you will be doing the calculation because you will be summarizing the data from all samples in tables. So you want to remember that the cheese is pre-dried for you. So you want to remember that when you determine the fat content, it's actually on a dry basis. So it's on a total solid basis. So on a dry basis, we, we have what we mean by dry basis, the amount of fat, which is you take the beaker or the flask plus fat minus the beaker or the flask, you get the fat content. That's if we're doing direct measurement of fat amount. And we divide it by the gram of the dry sample. How much dry sample we had? Did we weigh one gram? Did we weigh two grams? So we divide it by the weight of our dry sample and multiply by 100, we got the fat on a dry basis. But then I will tell you, okay, I want to know the fat content on as is basis, on wet basis or as is basis before you dry the cheese. You want to know the moisture content of your sample then you will be able to convert dry bases to wet bases. Wet bases meaning as is before we dry the sample. So here you have, okay, let's try this. And again, Laura will ask her to create a plus two um, assignment for Friday, 5 p.m. Would you tell Laura, please? Okay, so assignment plus two, Take a picture of it and submit it by Friday at 5 p.m. All right, so you have here the moisture content. You know the moisture content 20%. You will know the moisture content of the cheeses. We will tell you what moisture content of the cheeses to use. So we give you the moisture content. And you know that the fat content on dry basis is 15%. Okay, that's fat, fat is 15 You'll be doing this calculation actually for the lab and potentially for the quiz or the final but not this exam coming up. So any answers so far? Yes, Al? 
Well, is correct. Um, we not sure about the point five. Let's see. All right. Okay, so we're saying here that the fat on dry basis is 15%. That means 15 grams in 100 grams of dry matter. That's what it means. So 15 grams of fat in 100 grams of dry matter or dry substance, whatever you want to call it. What I want to know is how much fat I have in my original dry matter. In this original sample, I had 20% moisture. So my dry matter is 100 minus 20. So I have 80 grams of dry matter in my original sample, right? So it's 100 minus 20 is 80 grams dry matter. And then I just do the algebra math. So then it will be 15 times 80 over 100. And then we have gram, extra grams will cancel. And then you, I think it's 12 grams per 100. So it's 12%. Okay. Anybody would like me to repeat anything here? Okay. So the Maginer method is very simple and more, but more involved. You will get the answer in the same day. With the socks lid, it has to run six to eight hours, depending on how much fat we have in the sample. And then we have to take it out, dry it under the hood, put it in a desiccator for you to come and weigh the next day. In the Maginer method, it's a series of extractions that you actually do. You don't need to pre-dry the sample. Your sample will either be subjected to ammonium hydroxide, if, if it's like, say, a cheese sample where you have a coagulum there and your fat is entrapped, the ammonium hydroxide is going to solubilize things for you. You put ethanol to prevent any gelation formation while you're before you add your ethyl ether so that if any formation of a gel when you add your ethyl ether if you, if the gel is formed then your fat will be entrapped you'll get underestimation so we add ethanol ether you extract with the combination of ethyl ether and petroleum ether you do that a multiple times two to three times extraction where you put your sample uh, in here and sometimes we need to digest the digestion. If we need to digest with HCl, if you have high carbohydrate, this will be pre-done for you. So this will be digested ahead of time. Oh, for the, uh, actually, no, it's 30 minutes digestion. You do that in the lab. What will be pre-done for you is the solubilization with ammonium hydroxide for cheese samples. Because um, that takes several hours. So you weigh your sample, you add your acid, you do the digestion for 30 minutes, then you start your extraction. So the aqueous will separate from the solvent. We have a special centrifuge for this Mojiner glassware. You separate the two layers, you pour off the layer on top, which is the solvent and the fat, in a pre-weighed um, plate or container dish, we call it, pre-weighed aluminum dish. And you repeat the extraction once, twice, and you pour the solvent into the flask and then uh, the dish, and then you evaporate the solvent and you take the weight of the fat. That dish will be pre-dried, pre-weighed, and then you would determine the fat content by reference. So there's a lot of different steps that you will learn in the lab and how you would process different samples. So pretty cool, it's a very good, it's an official method of analysis. You don't need pre-drying and the use of acid or ammonium hydroxide help uh, extract the fat out of the matrix. So you'll see that Mojiner would be better for the high carbohydrate lipids in terms of accuracy than soft lipids, for example. So you will see that differences between the different samples. 
that, I'm one minute over. Uh, oh, before you leave, I, I have a two hours tomorrow, office hours uh, from eight to 10. I created a, a Zoom and I sent you that Zoom in the link. Visit me, I'll answer questions. I don't, I'm not preparing a presentation or anything. I'm just gonna be answering questions. And also Friday from eight to nine, I will be holding my regular office hours. So. Uh, please answer question, uh, come with questions. On uh, Friday, try to come 12.30 here. We'll be good. We can have you start area earlier, and if you need additional time, you have that, if you can. If not, that's okay. All right. See you Friday.